Joining me now is Peter Goodman, New York Times' global economics correspondent and author of Davos Man, How the Billionaires Devoured the World, along with David Sirota, former Bernie Sanders speechwriter, editor and founder of the news site The Lever, and co-writer and co-producer of the Oscar-nominated film Don't Look Up. Thank you both for coming back on the show for this discussion. Uh, David, let me start with you. Should we be spending less time on the yacht seizing and more time on the loopholes that these Russian oligarchs are using in the West to hide their wealth, Exhibit A apparently being Abramovich and U.S. hedge funds, according to The New York Times. Well, it's got to be both and. And you've touched on what the real problem is, is that the problem is, is that the uh, financial laws of the United States for many, many years uh, has been have been created to shadow, uh, to, sh to essentially shroud uh, this money and these assets in the shadows so that it's very difficult for law enforcement to even find uh, these assets. It was the FBI in 2020 that sounded a big alarm, saying that the American financial system had become so opaque uh, that it was helping people avoid sanctions. And the issue is, is we know what to do about it. Private equity and hedge funds, hedge funds you just mentioned, uh, they are effectively exempted from the same uh, basic longstanding bank secrecy laws that have existed for many years. And they fought for those exemptions. President Obama proposed extending basic bank secrecy laws to private equity and hedge funds in 2015. It didn't happen by the end of his presidency. Donald Trump didn't do it. And Joe Biden still has not proposed that basic expansion of those transparency laws, even as he's saying we're going to do everything we can to go after Russian oligarchs' yeah. assets. Peter, you wrote the book on the Davos men uh, here in right. the West, here in the United States. Name some names for us. Who are the billionaires in the U.S. who have been lobbying for years to ensure that the financial industry stays opaque, stays non-transparent? Yeah, I mean, start with one of my primary characters, Steve Schwartzman. He's the world's largest private equity magnate. He's worth, depending upon the day, something like $35 billion. And his industry has benefited, not by accident, from the fact uh, that we simply don't know who owns the assets. And we're not talking about, you know, a small pool assets. To your point, it's wonderful to go seize, you know, 400-foot yachts. We can all see it. It's titillating. It's, you know, wealthy person's porn and all that. But we're talking about $11 trillion worth of assets, so-called alternative assets. These are hedge funds, private equity funds, real estate funds. And we know that the art market, luxury real estate in places like Manhattan, in New York City, uh, parts of London, you know, are propped up. The asset prices are propped up by the fact that it's very easy to buy things without having to disclose who the owner is. And the point is, this did not happen by accident. This opaque system where the United States, uh, by many measures, is a more secretive place to put money than anywhere after the Cayman Islands. We're talking about worse than Switzerland, according to the UK-based Tax Justice Network. Uh, you know, this didn't happen by accident. It happened because people like Steve Schwartzman, because Larry Fink, uh, who's the founder of BlackRock, uh, which is the world's largest asset manager. This is a company that manages $10 trillion worth of assets, have put their money into uh, lobbying campaigns to prevent disclosure because it's very good for their bottom line interests. So, David, do you think the invasion of Ukraine will change any of this? Do you think there are people sitting inside the Treasury Department, inside the SEC, inside the Justice Department saying, all right, we're going after these Russian oligarchs, but we can't go after these Russian oligarchs unless we change rules that might affect the quote unquote American oligarchs too. Do you think those discussions are happening now, given the war or no? I would guess that they are happening, but of course it puts the the leadership in conflict with the donor class. I mean, this is a problem politically for the Biden administration in this sense, that it has on one hand, it has a huge amount of Wall Street donors that do not want uh, a basic financial transparency, but it also has a pledge uh, to go do whatever it takes to bring these assets to the forefront, to uh, help law enforcement track down these assets and prevent sanctions evasion. So those two things are in conflict. And the ultimate question for really for the Democratic Party's leadership is, which side are they going to be on? Are they going to be on the side of their financial donors or are they going to be on the side of their rhetoric that says it's time for the American finance, it's time to go after these oligarchs, which would require the American financial system to be a lot more transparent than it already is? 
Peter, there was a 2014 paper out of Princeton, you may remember. It received a lot of attention at the time. The paper found that, quote, economic elites and organized groups representing business interests have substantial independent impact on U.S. government policy, while average citizens and grassroots interest groups have little or no independent influence. Uh, a lot of the coverage of that paper uh, revolved around the term oligarchy. We right. spend a lot of time these days talking about America's march towards autocracy, but have we already long ago become an oligarchy or are oligarchs just people who live in Moscow? Well, let's not get too carried away. I mean, we still have elections. We're still having this conversation right now, exercising our speech rights. But we should note that our democratic rights are definitely threatened. And there is no question that well-financed interest groups, including you know the people I refer to in my book as Davos Man, uh, this subset of billionaires that would have us believe that if we uh, continue to cut taxes and deregulate, uh, all of our interests are somehow served, they definitely have a much greater sh say over the policies uh, than ordinary people. So our, our democracy has certainly been warped by all this money, uh, and there are all sorts of instances. Uh, you know, David's reporting, you know, has shown uh, very clearly in the in the in the lever uh, for previously the Daily Poster that you know the Biden administration doesn't even need congressional action in this particular case. They could just immediately force hedge funds and private equity funds and real estate investment trusts to disclose you know who uh, their uh, owners are, and yet they're not doing that. I, I put the question to a uh, Obama administration Treasury official last week. You know how come? And he essentially said, well, I, you know, I don't know. Uh, but clearly, there is some outsized interest among Davos man, our oligarchs, whatever yes. you'd like to call them. Well, I mean, you're right. We should put things in context. The United States of America, for all its many sins and flaws, uh, is still a democracy with all its sins and flaws of the democratic nature that we cover on this show regularly. And it's not comparable in that sense to the Russian political system. Having said that, when you talk about a billionaire having influence over the political process, David, I want to play this quick bite for you from back in October. Have a listen to billionaire Nelson Peltz praise his friend Joe Manchin for chipping away at the Build Back Better Act. Have a listen. I got to take my hat off to Joe, who's been an old friend of mine for 10 years. I call him every week and say, Joe, you're doing great. Say, stay tough. Stay <laughs> tough, buddy. There's no denying, David, that a billionaire like Peltz has more influence over Joe Manchin than the average American citizen. And we can't ignore the fact that his partner in crime, Kirsten Cinema, who helped him destroy Build Back Better, left negotiations to go back to Arizona for various fundraisers. It does remind you that senators who are already kind of walled off from public opinion in general, massive influence from billionaires and donors over our United States senators. Yeah, I mean, it's a really great point. And I think when we talk about the assault on democracy, it's, I've, I've said this before, I'll say it again. It's like, if you think democracy is under attack, let me, let me introduce you to all of the campaign money that flows into the American political system to essentially buy public policy. Point being is that if a democracy is a place where the government expresses the will of the people, and if I will call them oligarchs. If oligarchs are allowed to go in and simply buy public policy, in a, for instance, buying public policy to make sure the financial system isn't transparent enough for law enforcement to track down Russian oligarchs, if that's what's going on, then your democracy has been under attack for a lot longer than the last few years. It's been under systemic attack by Wall Street and the financial industry for decades. And Peter, just to connect... Uh, one block of this show to another. Earlier tonight, I was speaking to Russ Feingold and Carol Mosley Braun about the Supreme Court. Um, it is the Supreme Court, a reactionary uh, Republican led Supreme Court that gave us Citizens United, which unleashed a lot of that campaign finance right. money that David just referred to. You study these men, the Davos men, the billionaires in America. How important was that ruling to them? How much did they really celebrate that ruling? Oh, it's incredibly important. I mean, if we're going to talk about the power to influence elections, I mean, that that just totally ripped off uh, the checks that we had on the process that were designed to ensure that everybody gets a vote that's equal, not so equal when you can essentially funnel unlimited sums of money with limited to no disclosure uh, into the campaign. And at the same time, of course, we have 
threats to ballot access. So even the single vote that ordinary people have is under attack from the other side, often by corporate interests that are playing on social issues or fears of fraud as a way to essentially circumvent and preempt accountability uh, for their abuses of our democratic system. We will have to leave it there. Peter Goodman, David Sirota, thank you. And I must add, David Sirota, good luck with the Oscars and don't look up. I've got to throw in a good luck there to you. Thank, thank you both so for much. joining me tonight. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.